when I was invited to share this space with you, the vision of my 10-year journey with LCT came to me as a semantic wave. I saw it immediately. And for those of you who know me, I naturally drew it. There it is. Now, for anybody new to this community, you will have gathered by now, this is a field in which we all draw or wave our hands, and everybody knows what you mean. There's very little as powerful as a common language, and LCT is fast becoming the lingua franca of knowledge practice research in any field, and way beyond education. So I'm going to take you on my cumulative learning journey over the past 10 years, across LCT dimensions, and drawing on a number of the different instruments. I've shared this journey with many of you here today, but there are a number of individuals whom I regard as my personal Virgils. I think it only fitting that on our last day at LCT3, a decade down the road since the early Knowledge and Knowers chapters were being circulated, that we reflect on how far we've come and pay homage to a few remarkable individuals who've helped shape the field. So I'm afraid this reflection is a very personal one. Um, it is rather selfishly through my own gaze and insights and about my journey, but in relation to the field. So we're going to start right at the bottom of the wave. There I was, beginning of my career in higher education as a lecturer at a University of Technology on a brand new multidisciplinary diploma program. Now, our first cohort of third years was in 2009. And without exception, they declared their first two years as an absolute waste. Because the first half of this third year was in a self-regulated, simulated factory environment. They saw absolutely no connection between the latest automated technologies they were expected to master and the preceding theoretical courses like material science and digital systems and electronics. That was the start of what was probably to become an obsession with the theory-practice disjuncture. And so it was that my good friend and first mentor in this space, Cecilia Jacobs, took charge of things. Before I knew it, I was back at my alma mater, University of Cape Town, to do my master's in higher education studies, part-time. There I was, a 44-year-old single mother working full-time with two decades of in-the-trenches real-world teaching, when I was first inducted into several alien discourses, simultaneously, academic, educational, sociological, to name a few. I railed at the system, these head in the clouds people, for its utter impracticality. I railed at the terminology and the turf wars and the inaccessibility of the discourses. I sat in Cecilia Jacobs' office every few weeks and cried my way through my masters. Everybody needs a Cecilia Jacobs. I remember the pain, I, I mean this, of tackling the discourses and the powerlessness I felt. I kept saying, as I said in several letters to Cecilia, I have read two million words by now and they all say the same thing. There are systems that oppress, it's our duty to unpack those and it's our duty to make explicit the tools with which one can unpack those so as to change them. But I was mature enough at the time to know that that powerlessness was probably exactly what my first year students were feeling. And then I was introduced to Basil Bernstein by the wonderful Kathy Luckett, who was to be my master supervisor. It was sheer fluke that I encountered Bernstein that early in my course with masters in the very first year, it was a scheduling issue. And I vividly remember reading the first Bernsteinian text, chapter two, pedagogy, symbolic control and identity and going, what? So I did what any good student would do. I marched into the UCT library and took out every single Bernstein text I could find as of 1971. And I spent the entire winter break devouring these books. And after the long, hard slog up that first incline from the world of my classroom and into that of academia, I suddenly had an epiphanous experience. The words structure, power and control in Bernstein's sociological sense, gave me insight, the pun is premature, but intended, into what it was that my students were struggling with. You see, Negatronics, the program I taught on, is about structure, power and control. 
And precisely as with the Bernstinian sociological concepts, in engineering, structures lend themselves to concretization. While power is less tangible and control is almost invisible in the sense that there's no direct translation or apparent connection between the concrete objects of a system and the languages used to manipulate them. Wonderful. This is all very well. I can see it. But how does one operationalize these degrees of concreteness and invisibility? And then I met Colmaton. And everything changed. The benevolent misfit. I had already read a number of the early knowledge and Noah's chapters and his PhD, but having this enthusiastic, sacrilegious, sometimes scathing, most non-ivory towered academic in our midst was mind-blowing for me. I remember standing on the steps at UCT, smoking, yep, he used to, and Carl with his inevitable flask of tea and sinusitis from jet lag, and being in awe, partially for his ability not to bow to the establishment, but mostly because he actually listened and encouraged me to talk about my research problem. And he let me do my own thing with those fantastic early semantics tools. And so it was that I had a way to tackle this structure power control issue, the knowledge areas that my students were working with. I got to describe those and unpack those with semantics. What's interesting is that I hadn't discovered Herbert Simon yet, who differentiates between inner and outer environments of an artifact, but I was trying to capture different forms of knowledge practices, those of the discipline and those of the world in which these disciplinary practices were being enacted. It was the next LCT instrument that helped me take this further. With my masters behind me, I started looking towards my PhD and had begun to work with academic staff on curriculum at CPUT. Now it was clear to me that the engineering standards, the new engineering standards, were trying to build a holistic professional and that most of the outcomes ostensibly or apparently had nothing to do with disciplinary knowledge per se, rather they were about attributes and dispositions. Now, specialization was becoming a powerful tool for many of the researchers who had by now begun to work in this space, particularly at a curricular level in the context of global recurriculation shifts, whether the Bologna process or our very own South African higher education qualification sub-framework. Now, two key influencers in my personal journey, Sue Ellen Shea and Chris Winberg, had used the instrument to enable the differentiation or to interrogate the differentiation between the basis of achievement as strengths of epistemic and social relations. Now, specialization has continued to be the go-to instrument in the professional curricular space and has certainly been instrumental in my academic development work, enabling staff to unpack things like the graduate attributes and to see the relationship between the epistemic relations and the social relations in their curricula and pedagogic spaces. Now, I've also used it to explain the different bases of legitimation in engineering assessment, and more recently as an instrument to review the development of our national engineering education community of practice. Now, during this work with staff across many institutions, students had begun to raise their voices in protest at the very question of legitimation, whose knowledge, whose rules, and while the country was focusing on the students, I witnessed increasingly low morale and even desperation as academics tried to make sense of their roles and their work. It was Hanji Konana, my good friend, who mentioned the other day that some part of our role as academic developers even includes counselling, which Shoban Nalini also referred to. Now, during a particularly trying period while working at CPUT, I'd gotten used to wondering whether or not this particular engineering department would actually arrive for my monthly workshop, given the violence on campus. I discovered that the LCT workshops were fast becoming a haven for these staff members, simultaneously offering brief respite from the outside and deeper insights into the very causes of what was happening on the outside. As an academic developer, 
If ever I needed proof of the symbiotic relationship between knowledge and knowers, this was it. A personal highlight for me was being able to collaborate with two of my key Virgils on my journey, Cecilia Jacobs and Chris Winberg, on a paper which clearly established this synergy, where the strengthening of the social relations can support a strengthening of the epistemic relations in the scholarship of teaching and learning development. You only have yourselves to look at, and this very Robert to look at, to see how true that is. However, my personal interest still lay in understanding knowledge practices from an epistemological perspective. Now, I had observed during all my teaching two broadly different types of engineering students, those who jumped in and figured things out by trial and error, and those who sat down and started writing or reading or sketching. Now for me, erroneous as this is going to sound, or it is erroneous, but it was my interpretation, I connected this with Immanuel Kant's differentiation between analytic and synthetic judgments. Now when I started looking at different kinds of student performance in different kinds of knowledge areas, it was as though they were more or less responsive to certain kinds of knowledge structures, to certain ways of thinking. The epistemic plane was a godsend to me because it captured the relationship between kinds of phenomena essential to engineering knowledge practices and the vast continuum of approaches to those phenomena. And so my PhD journey, PhD journey flanked by the formidable Carl Mayton and gentle and efficient Sue Ellen Shea, took me back down the wave into the real world of engineering industries, mapping how different practitioners worked with what operationalized the epistemic plane in such a way as to retain references to the three core forms of disciplinary knowledge on which I was focusing, physics, mathematics, and logic. That's the green, red, and blue shading you see on the arrows. And I interpreted the graduate problem-solving journey across approaching a problem, analyzing the cause, identifying it, and coming up with a solution while tracking how they spoke about those different forms of knowledge. In other words, which insights were demonstrated in their problem-solving process. This work continued well into my postdoc with Chris Winberg. Now today, armed with over 50 case studies across engineering sectors, we know the following. Context and size matter. The larger the organization, and the more hierarchical the organizational structure, the further away the practitioner is located from purest insights. In other words, the more it is that knowers and situational complexity will actually dictate the problem solving process. Now in our engineering education system, we are predominantly limiting what it is we're doing on the right hand side of the epistemic plane. While industry, keeps calling for the attributes or insights of the left-hand side of the epistemic plane. This code clash and, and the biggest uh, 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 challenge our students face or our early young graduates face is being able to shift from right to left. So what happens is that those who are stuck on the right-hand side and cannot adapt to the more open-ended problem solving if they don't have the time actually end up leaving and vice versa. There are industries which want the right hand side of the epistemic plane and sometimes they get more practitioners with, with greater situational insight or knower insight and they are, this is also a code clash in a lot of the R&D kind of sector. Now this code clash is matched in several industrial contexts, not from right to left or left to right, but from top to bottom where we see a steady weakening of the ontic relations in the name of the so-called triple bottom line philosophy, where companies claim to ascribe to a people, planet and profit ethic. Now a telltale sign is often the sudden prominent display of the family tree of the organization or evidence of a recent ostensible wellness campaign, which is not matched on the ground 
by paper-driven managerialist micromanagement and compliance. Now in most such cases in the industries I visited where these signs of patching were evident, I saw graduates resigning and poor productivity and low morale. What we also know from a number of FYE studies is that students actually enter the engineering education system with unrecognized or unacknowledged strengths on the left hand side of the plane. Now a small study on matriculants attending an engineering winter school program and first year engineering students revealed that successful students have stronger situational insights. In other words, they are more open to open-ended problem solving and higher education somehow forces them across this boundary into these kind of singular insights. And I suggest this is as a result of our compliance oriented approaches to engineering assessment. Now secondly, as part of the same study in using the social plane to examine successful students' position in relation to the field and its practices, these successful students speak of prior access to the field by way of exposure during pre-tertiary education or parents and relatives working in similar spaces. Now, we lose 50% of all students enrolling for engineering qualifications in this country and we are faced with tremendous development challenges. Despite massification and ostensible access to higher education, 51% of our graduates in 2019 are unemployed and this while we have a list of over 360 skills we are in desperate need of with a significant number of them being engineering related. In an attempt to address this crisis if only in a small way and given the benefits of a decade of theoretically informed empirical research in the field I now have the privilege of establishing a new engineering faculty for a new national private university. The team is comprised of colleagues with whom I've worked for a number of years across higher education institutions and industries, as well as young academics. Our entire approach is centered around the design and implementation of curricula and a learning environment shaped explicitly and openly by semantics and specialization. So Carl, you've given birth to a faculty. Now, I'd like to say that the development of professional identity is an orchestrated dance between the strengthening of the social relations to support the strengthening of the epistemic relations and vice versa. Now, using the LCT instruments in the design of the environment, the materials and the user interface, we hope to enact this dance. We hope to provide the kind of space where our students can actually experience this dance. In my work with Stellenbosch and other academics, we're seeing the recognition of gazes and insights and their relationship in community of practice building, both in the scholarship of teaching and learning space, as well as in the classroom. Now, knowledge building as a community of practice endeavor could be seen as a social cumulative learning wave. In simple terms, the effective symbiosis between knowledge and knowers concepts and contexts, I believe, is underpinned by what Bernstein terms the relational idea. Navigating complexity requires the social realist both and position with clear consensus as to the phenomenon behind the knowledge practice, particularly in more complex evolving professional regions. When there is no consensus or no clear re relational idea, we're not talking about simplicity, we're talking about seeing the golden thread within the complexity. In other words, where we do not see this and we see distinct code clashes, any practice is doomed to fail in the longer term. Now it's one thing having experienced this personally, having researched this empirically over the past decade, but it's an entirely different thing when you experience such code clashes at a deeply personal level.
The reality of my experience of the healthcare system is one dominated by compliance-driven doctrinal procedures. Every bit of evidence of low morale and inefficiency that I had gleaned from my engineering problem-solving research to date was visible. The personal staff statements from a recent wellness and identity workshop were clearly not playing out on the floor itself, where I witnessed racism, lack of empathy, bowed heads pouring over endless rooms of paperwork. Staff confirmed inordinate amounts of documentation, which no longer enabled them to do their real jobs. Now this was in stark contrast to my session with my code shifting surgeon, whom I've known for a number of years. At our post-diagnosis consultation, which he conducted on a public holiday as a result of my work schedule, thus clearly demonstrating what we call Noah Insight, um, taking the human being into account. His first words were, let's talk about your situation and what is going to work for you. So he starts on the left-hand side of the plane. He then moved into summarizing the standardized, te standardized tests I'd undergone, and then into a technical and scientific analysis of the tumor in question. Now, I'd already examined this tumor via software I'd installed, probably illegally, from the discs handed to me by the various radiologists. I was more interested in the, t the equipment and the procedures. I mean, it just comes from being a researcher in, in the field, automatically. Uh, nevertheless, we talked through all of these and then he shifted specifically into the bottom right quadrant demonstrating appropriate doctrinal insight when he took me through the practicalities and logistics of the surgical radiation and treatment procedures and he ended with you need to prepare yourself for the paperwork you're going to encounter well that must have been the understatement of the bloody millennium despite all the appropriate authorizations and years of premiums, thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of rands that I have forked out to my medical aid, and the ostensible full coverage, and the paperwork ridden testing and hospital procedures. There have been 140 emails between myself and the various suppliers and practitioners over the past six weeks. With incorrect allocations, demands for payment, miscommunication between different subsectors, and thousands and thousands of words in fine print. Now, if I, as a privileged, educated, middle class South African female, am drowning in the incomprehensibility of this system that has the audacity to call itself health care. What of the millions of less fortunate human beings in our country? Secondly, as when I first was inducted into academia 10 years ago, I am again reminded of that feeling of utter powerlessness. And I want to suggest it's not about the inaccessibility of the discourses. I believe it's about clear evidence of ever weakening ontic relations. At best, the absolute lack of consensus as to the purpose of any particular system. At worst, just blatant dishonesty. My expectation that the healthcare system is about caring for health has not been met. By the same token, I believe that a significant number of our students entering the higher education system expecting an education are not receiving one for precisely the same reason. An absolute lack of consensus as to the purpose of the system if not downright dishonesty. Now, in some strange way, the LCT tools have been a friend in need. I kid you not, because they've helped me see and understand and given me another, albeit unofficial, research project. But understanding is not enough. Seeing is not enough. So I have decided to conduct my own personal protest appended to the responses of at least the past 50 emails is an open letter to the healthcare system. Now, the letter introduces the reader to my context and work, 
in fairly accessible terms, I believe, and offers a full reflective account of my experience and an analysis of their system using the epistemic plane. Now, they want to ask some feedback. You get endless little emails saying, we would appreciate your feedback. This is a customer care survey. We would appreciate your feedback. Well, I, they got their feedback. The letter then concludes with a number of findings from my very unauthorized interviews with staff while wandering the corridors in the middle of the night and being awake for 24 hours because the sleeping medication didn't work. And I ended with a list of recommendations. And this is the message I bring to you. Seeing is not enough. Seeing and understanding must empower. The student to become a legitimate participant in society, staff to change the way they teach, institutions and organizations to interrogate what it is they are. Aslam Fatah and our panel on Wednesday support precisely what it is that LCT has set out to do. Offer an analytical, explanatory and transformative framework for knowledge practices. We have seen such rich examples of the transformative power of our LCT community over the past decade right here this week. Personal examples for me in this space are Sharon Clarence and Steve Kirk with their tremendous work on truly enabling access to discursive practices with semantics. Mags Blackie for paving the way forward with conceptualizing chemistry education. Hanley Ardendorf tackling and engaging with issues around decolonization in science. Colleagues, we are privileged to have access to this space, these colleagues, mentors, each other, these powerful, very powerful instruments. The one thing I believe we share is what Bernstein terms the relational idea. I think there is a golden thread here that can lead to the kind of action that can truly begin to transform this neoliberal capitalist mess we're living in.